family mode. Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I'm coordinator of the Coastal Marine EBM Tools Network, uh, which is coordinated by NatureServe and OpenChannels.org. And uh, we have Nick Weiner, who is also on today from OpenChannels.org, who is co-moderating the webinar. Uh, we'd like to thank you all for being on. Um, today's webinar is going to be presented by John Tobin de la Puente. And we are super excited he's here because he took a red eye to Chile last night. Uh, and uh, has barely gotten settled in. So we're very glad he was able to, to do this today. Uh, he's going to be speaking today about bringing finance and conservation together, the Coalition for Private Investment and Conservation, or CPIC. Um, right before I turn it over to John, I wanted to let all of you know um, to, how to ask questions. So. Well, first of all, we'll have the presentation by John, and then we'll have a substantial amount of time for question and answer at the end. And we highly encourage you to send in questions. The way you do this is by typing the, the question into the question panel of the user interface. Then I'll see that question, or Nick will see that question, and we'll relay it to John. Um, feel free to go ahead and send questions in throughout the webinar. Um, in fact, it's, it's often helpful to us to have some, some early questions as people think about what they want to ask. So uh, yes, feel free to send it in throughout the webinar and um, and we, we will relay the questions to John as many as we're able to during the time that we have. So John, thank you so much for being here. We'll, we'll turn it over to you now. My pleasure. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let me just start by saying that uh, I have a reasonable amount of uh, reasonably large amount of slides here today, but I do want to leave as much time as possible for discussion at the end. So if you do have a question uh, about a particular slide that I happen to uh, breeze through a little too quickly, uh, please make sure that you pass that on to Sarah and uh, be happy to address it uh, at the end. I'm aiming to uh, have us down uh, done with the actual presentation uh, within 30 to 40 minutes. So, um, Getting right into it then, in terms of uh, uh, conservation finance, and in particular the Coalition for Private Investment and Conservation. Uh, first, a little bit of background on conservation finance, which is the bringing together of conservation and of finance, as the name would suggest. But uh, it's important to distinguish uh, between conservation finance and conservation funding. Funding is, uh, you know, the raising of funds generally from either governmental or philanthropic sources. Uh, and that is much of how conservation has been uh, uh, run up until now. But there has been a current over the course of the past uh, a, a decade uh, and longer, uh, even though it has developed quite slowly of people who have said, hey, listen, let, if we're going to be really successful in raising funds uh, from, uh, for conservation, we're going to have to go beyond the more traditional model of obtaining funding for conservation and actually turning, turn it in somehow into a branch of finance, turn it into a financial activity. And by that, I mean specifically an activity in which there are investors, who are expecting a return in which there are individuals or institutions who are putting a hundred on the table on the expectation that a year from now they will receive 102 or 105 or whatever else. Uh, if it is not that, or at least if that is not the element uh, or an element of a transaction or of a package in which yes, in some cases, perhaps there might be philanthropic funding uh, 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 as, as an additional element of the, of the, of the package, of the transaction, then uh, it's probably better not to refer to it as conservation finance uh, because of the, uh, um, the confusion that, that can arise in terms of, uh, of terminology and, and the similarity with funding. So conservation finance, investors, returns. Uh, let's start from there. Um, now, how does conservation finance work and what does it seek to accomplish? The idea is to create new and long-term and diversified sources of revenue supporting biodiversity conserva conservation. And the way that it accomplishes that is through the development of 
uh, investment products that provide market returns or near market returns and that target private investors. But again, I'll mention that in many cases you have uh, uh, elements of the transaction that are uh, philanthropic or governmental that support or in some way make it possible for that private part of the transaction to happen. Um, in 2014, Credit Suisse published a, a report in coordination or in, in partnership with WWF and with McKinsey uh, describing a series of mechanisms uh, that uh, uh, can be used to help preserve a healthy ecosystem and to conserve uh, the value of the ecosystem in, in the long term. And it was all about generating cash flows and generally ge uh, generating cash flows through the development of uh, 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 transactions that uh, provide returns. Uh, I'm going to, I'm skipping, to, I'm jumping to the next slide. I hope everyone can follow this. Uh, there are a number of points that were made in that uh, report from 2014, um, but perhaps the most important point was the magnitude of the unmet demand for funding for conservation activities. Uh, and the fact that in doing a survey of the academic and gray literature uh, of the various estimates, and yes, there are a number of estimates out there about how much it would cost to get conservation right. It sh we found that we are nowhere near we should be in terms of uh, 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 spending on conservation. Indeed, we're probably 20 or 30 times uh, uh, um, from where we have to be. Um, as you can imagine, scaling up private finance uh, can pose a number of challenges, uh, but, uh, but some of those are what we're going to be talking about when I get to the part on CPIC. Um, ultimately, the, the aim of all of this that is happening right now, the conservation finance space would be to establish conservation as an asset class so that it is a mainstream category of product that investors can um, participate in uh, uh, actively and, and add to their portfolios. Uh, this is uh, the 2016 follow-on study. I'm not going to go into this study in any detail. Suffice it to say that um, the most important point that was made in this study was the need for standardization and scaling. Uh, and as uh, my colleague Dave Chen likes to put it, uh, we need to move towards boring even though finance types don't like boring, they like innovative and cutting edge, and that's where a lot of the excitement comes. If we're really going to raise enough money to, to fill the conservation funding gap, conservation finance is going to have to become a, quote, boring, unquote, activity, where certain types of transactions are scaled up and or repeated uh, in such a way that it really brings in the money. Now, if you take nothing away from what I'm going to say over the next few minutes, I'd like you to, to uh, take this with you uh, 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 that is on this slide. And it has to do with the funding gap. Um, we estimated when we did this work in late 2013, published it in early 2014, that approximately $52 billion a year are being spent on conservation related activities. Of those 42 billion are, uh, come from philanthropic or governmental sources and 10 billion approximately come from uh, private sources, from private investors. And that includes everything from sustainable commodities to ecotourism to a number of uh, other related activities that have as a direct consequence the protection or at least better management of natural habitats. Um, on the right-hand uh, bar, you see what is needed if we're going to do conservation right. 
And the estimates out, uh, out there that we found were ranged somewhere between 200 billion and 500 billion a year. We use three to 400 billion a year as a consensus number. And even assuming a doubling over the say five year horizon of what governments and philanthropy in spend on conservation today. So that would bring us to roughly 80 to $100 billion a year. That nevertheless, um, even under the, those, that very re, uh, optimistic uh, growth scenario in the medium term, would still leave a gap of roughly 210 to $290 billion a year that we need and we need soon to start spending on conservation if we're going to have a reasonably sustainable uh, set of uh, uh, ecosystems that we have, can pass on to future generations. That is a lot of money. Um, and the likelihood that the philanthropic sector um, is able to fill that gap uh, or that governments, which are generally maxed out on their spending on all programs, not just in uh, 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 environmental programs, are, are going to greatly increase their, their spending. That is especially under the present circumstances uh, in a number of countries, uh, notably in the United States, completely unrealistic. So the scenario from that point of view looks bleak. What, what we spend versus what we need to spend. However, and this is where the story gets a little bit more interesting. Um, that conservation funding gap, while it is huge, represents only roughly 1% of all new and reinvested capital flowing into the capital markets, the investment markets every year. So from that point of view, suddenly it appears to be a much more realistic proposition that we'll be able to uh, 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 fill the funding gap if, and this is a big if, if we're able to tap into that uh, just 1% of all of that new and reinvested capital. Um, I would like to tell you now about a, a study that is a was published in early 2017. It's about the state of the private investment in conservation markets in 2016. I, uh, I, I present the following slides because they present, uh, they're a good point of comparison with the numbers that we came up with here. Uh, the 10 million in current uh, conservation uh, spending coming from private sources that we estimated is part of this study uh, is generally supported and generally consistent with the work that was done as part of this study in uh, 2016, again, published early this year. Uh, and that was the State of Private Investment in Conservation 2016. Some of you may have seen this study. Um, it uh, involved a number of institutions as part of the advisory committee, including some financial institutions, uh, environmental NGOs, uh, academics, and others. I won't go into the details of the study, but, uh, but I will mention that it focused on three specific areas sustainable food and fiber production, habitat conservation, and water quality and quantity. And the methodology was you know, very, um, very straightforward. It involved direct outreach to investors whom we believed were or could be involved in investing in the conservation markets uh, today in these three categories of, uh, 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 of, of investments, again, sustainable food and fiber, habitat, and water. And uh, we reached out to roughly 500 uh, high net worth individuals and institutional investors, got a response from, oh, somewhere in the order of 130 responses. Uh, and the distribution of the responses is as shown in this study. Uh, roughly 75%, 70-75% uh, of those responses from North America. We got 
28 responses from Europe, uh, 11 from Latin America, and various others from other parts of the world. And the questionnaire that we uh, asked these various respondents to fill out was actually very detailed. Um, some highlights. This is one that shows how, what were the return expectations of these 130 uh, odd investors um, in terms of their internal rate of return on their investment. Uh, it divided between not-for-profit uh, respondents and for-profit respondents. And you'll see that uh, while there are some differences between for-profit and not-for-profit respondents, uh, what's important here is that the responses are not dramatically different, number one. And number two, uh, everyone was expecting some kind of return. Uh, even if not-for-profit respondents were more tempered in their uh, return expectations, uh, but, uh, but uh, were nevertheless expecting some kind of return for their, uh, their investments in, in the three categories that we discussed. Another highlight of the study, um, it shows enormous growth from the 2004 to 2008 period into the 2009 to 2013 period, and then 2014 and 2015, which are set apart. In terms of private capital committed um, uh, per, uh, uh, per period, that grew from 0 0.2 billion in the 2004 to 2008 period to a full 2 billion a year in 2015. And the cumulative uh, capital committed to conservation investments, return seeking conservation investments over the course of the uh, uh, period of study uh, was $8.2 billion. Uh, so growth is rapid, uh, growth is happening. But as many of you will realize, it's, it's growing and it's uh, growing rapidly from an exceedingly low base. Um, this may in some, case, in some ways be the most interesting result and one that from the point of view of CPIC, which again I will speak to you uh, about uh, shortly, uh, is a very encouraging one. And the, the question here for uh, the investors was, uh, how much of the private capital that you have set aside for investment in these three categories of conservation investments is currently undeployed? In other words, how much money do you have set aside that you would like to spend on conservation projects that deliver some kind of return, but you have not been able to deploy because you haven't uh, found uh, uh, projects that meet your risk return uh, uh, requirements or that uh, you've been able to do due diligence to your satisfaction that uh, the project is well run. And the percentage of capital that is out there available waiting for conservation projects to be, uh, 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 that can be, that it can be invested in was actually exceedingly high. So the lesson from this for uh, conservationists is, gosh, if we can only structure a, an investment that is attractive, uh, then we would have uh, ready uh, and willing investors coming to us very, very quickly. Um, the problem in this case, and this is this is this is a problem that many people would love, many people in other areas of finance would love to have. Investors saying that they want to invest in that sector, but that they can't find enough deals to invest in. Think about that for a moment. Um, so, Mindful of the fact that uh, there is uh, a huge need for private, for capital uh, and for financing in the conservation space, that we cannot really expect governments and charities, traditionally the main sources of conservation funding, to fill in that gap because the, back, the gap is too big and the ability of government funding and philanthropic funding 
to grow is limited. Okay, so given that reality, given also the reality that there is willing capital out there to be put into conservation investments, but that relatively too, uh, few transactions have, have uh, 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 been made available to investors so far. That to us, uh, as we were thinking about this, pointed into some interesting directions. And that's what the next few slides are about. Um, first, allow me to editorialize for a, a couple of minutes. Uh, I'd like to argue that the traditional approach to conservation has, has delivered exceedingly well, uh, but we need to do more. And that goes back to how much we spend on conservation versus how much we have to spend. Uh, the traditional model of raising funds from philanthropic and governmental sources to fund direct conservation activities, in part, and some of that money, of course, has to be reinvested into further fundraising activities, has delivered a number of successes, but just not enough given current needs. Uh, furthermore, we find ourselves in a political situation in many countries, including in the United States, where the public has become polarized and the discussion about the inherent value of nature is one that tends to separate people rather than bring them apart. Uh, furthermore, even sympathetic members of the public uh, have at this point grown somewhat tired in, in, in certain cases of the gloom and doom message of environmental organizations of we have to do X, uh, we have to protect more habitat, we have to uh, take better care of our biodiversity um, while providing relatively uh, little in the way that average people can do. And in particular, that average investors who have the power to influence outcomes through how they deploy their capital. Um, so maybe it's time to consider a few alternative approaches to environmental conservation to complement the activities that, uh, that uh, 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 we have undertaken in the last few decades, which have gotten qu us quite far, but, uh, but recognizing that we still need to go further. So what do we need then? Uh, let me just point out that there are relatively few activities that directly contribute to sustainably generating revenue for environmental conservation, at least today. Uh, ecotourism is an obvious example, people paying to visit habitat that has been preserved. Hunting licenses, highly controversial, but they do, most people would recognize, support at least to some extent conservation activities. Um, Taking a very different tack, um, the former CEO of TNT and current head of WBCSD, Petr Bakker, some of you may have uh, heard him speak, a very sort of plain spoken, blunt uh, 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 Dutchman who has a knack for putting things in, in, uh, in very stark terms. Uh, has argued an article in the Harvard Business Review that, you know, much to the, uh, I think this, this would sound laughable but to many, but he's argued that accountants will save the world. Um, because the argument goes, we need to better account for the value of some of the uh, 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 resources that we're not managing appropriately and the externalities that we're not uh, uh, accounting for. I would argue, however, that yes, while accountants could do a lot, uh, smart financial structuring may be just as important uh, to saving the world or saving the natural world as accounting may be. Um, and what do I mean with that? Uh, well, uh, I take it as a given, and I'd be happy to debate this during the Q&A with anyone who would like to, but I take it as a given that Unfortunately, nature is going to have to pay for itself if we're going to have if we're going to maintain much of it in the long term. Of course, monetizing nature is e easy if you're willing to transform it. You clear a forest and you put a palm oil plantation in its place. But that's not the kind of uh, uh, um, 
monetization that we want. That's not the way uh, 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 nature could pay for itself by not becoming nature. Um, the difficult thing really here is to monetize conservation habitat. Um, again, uh, uh, ecotourism is one great example. There are others. Um, but um, we need to preserve rather than alter or degrade nature. And this is crucial, and this needs to be uh, tackled right away. Um, and, and I would Shadow. argue that, yes. I I didn't want to interrupt you. There was a question. Um, so you mentioned ecotourism as a way that uh, conservation uh, could make money. There could be a return on conservation investment. Could you give us some other examples? Of course. Um, well, one other obvious example, which is um, some people view as not the best because um, because it does involve some uh, habitat uh, transformation or degradation is uh, sustainable commodities. Sustainable commodities is a better way of doing agriculture, but it is agriculture nevertheless. And agriculture, of course, has impacts uh, or organic agriculture. Um, fisheries, in fact, provides a really interesting example and and given uh, who's on the line uh, i was going to, i was sort of building up towards that uh, so we will uh, we will get to it uh, but okay. yes there we'll are, wait we'll wait thank you okay sorry there are other examples um so um by bringing together smart finance minds to turn their attention to this problem um, you know, several of us sitting around the table came to the conclusion that, gosh, maybe, maybe financial structuring, maybe the kinds of thinking that went into develop financial products, whether it's um, derivatives or securitization or structured notes, or many of the things that uh, we have all heard about, sometimes in 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 a uh, uh, in, uh, in a negative way. Uh, and I would argue to you today that securitization, for example, is an absolutely brilliant way of tapping into future cash flows. It just so happens that some of the securitization that we saw, particularly leading up to the financial crisis, uh, was poorly risk managed. But that is not the fault of the the concept of securitization that merely is telling us that we need to be more cautious about how risk management is applied to securitization. But let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. And if we're going to be really successful, maybe we do need to come up with the next securitization or credit default swap uh, or other uh, financial instrument or investment that will attract capital to this space and at the same time, uh, will have positive environmental impacts. Um, indeed, and this is uh, where I uh, 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 start talking a little bit about fisheries. Fisheries provide an excellent example of how economic and conservation interests can be aligned. By not conserving fish stocks, we, as the managers of the global commons, shoot ourselves in the foot. Um, by not fishing in the short term and allowing fish stocks to recover, we are actually, in, in some cases, and this doesn't apply in all cases because it's some fisheries just have gotten to a point where they do not recover. But in most cases, if we were to allow overexploited fisheries today to recover by sacrificing short-term revenue resulting from fishing, in order to fish much more volume once that fish stock had recovered. That makes not just conservation sense, that makes pure hard-nosed economic sense. And um, just like there are opportunities uh, to better manage fisheries and therefore create more wealth, not less, by conserving biodiversity and by conserving uh, fish stocks. Uh, there are other examples that need, that people who know the field, working together with smart finance types who actually have a good eye for spotting investment opportunities. 
can, can identify. Uh, environmental impact bonds, uh, some of you may have heard of them. Uh, others who may not have heard of EIBs uh, may have heard of SIBs, social impact bonds. Uh, there have been a number of them over the course of the past, uh, say, five to eight years. Uh, the first one came out of the UK and it involved a process to invest in job training programs for prisoners. Uh, that would result in lower recidivism rates in the future. So by investing X in training people today to do something once they leave prison, you would actually prevent a future expense of 2X or 3X associated with putting that person back behind bars. Uh, it makes smart economic sense, it makes smart social sense and in the case of these environmental impact bonds that uh, are being worked on now one just closed uh, in the last uh, few months and there are others in the pipeline we're coming up with solutions that slowly but surely that uh, develop uh, pardon me that provide returns and that provide uh, 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 environmental uh, benefits um, and that is what ultimately CPIC is all about, about identifying those opportunities and proposing those financial structures and mechanisms that will lead to better environmental outcomes as well as providing financial returns. But and how do you do that? By bringing together finance and bringing together sort of business-minded conservationists to work together to identify those opportunities. Um, so, what is co uh, the Coalition for Private Investment and Conservation uh, then? What is the CPIC and how does it work? Well, it all got started um, through various conversations between Credit Suisse, my former employer, uh, the Nature Conservancy, IUCN, and Cornell, where I am currently based. And the notion being, being, we need to develop investable products now because we're in a desperate need to attract capital to the conservation space. The, we look around us and the only solution we can find or the only possible source of funding we can find to fill that gap is the private sector. We see no other solution. And the people who are involved in this are not involved in it because of any particular ideological allegiance towards the notion of free markets or capitalism. It is merely, and uh, I can certainly say that for myself, and I believe I'm speaking for most of the steering committee of, of CPIC, merely because we see this as the only realistic short to medium term solution to bring more money into the space. Uh, so the initiative was launched in Hawaii at the uh, World Conservation Congress of the IUCN in September 2016 with uh, roughly 30 endorsers of the uh, uh, CPIC statement of interest, uh, pardon me, of intent. And um, the statement of intent uh, addresses a number of points, but uh, most importantly, it calls for the coming together of the finance sector and the conservation sector to look to develop the solutions that we've been talking about. Um, it's a voluntary initiative, and uh, 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 the immediate aims uh, of the coalition are to uh, scale up conservation investment by creating models or blueprints. Some of you may be familiar with the blueprints that uh, encourage capital uh, made public one or two years ago with the support of Rockefeller Foundation and Bloomberg Philanthropies. Uh, that's one example and one way of producing uh, blueprints. Uh, the blueprints coming out of CPIC might might uh, look a little bit uh, different. Uh, they will probably be, probably be broader in their application, less focused on a particular geography. But the basic notion is let us open source information that would otherwise not be available. Do the kind of work, the 80% of the work that we as a coalition can do 
and make available to the private sector so that the private sector and other uh, organizations take this work because I should emphasize the private sector is not in a good position to do work that can take years to develop, uh, that uh, has uncertain uh, returns at the end. They need, uh, rightly or wrongly, to meet budgets this year and to deliver revenue this year. Uh, um, CPIC has the luxury of a little bit more time and a, le a little bit more flexibility. Let's develop these blueprints, make them available for the private sector and other actors to pick up, adapt to their local circumstances and to their particular systems, and cross, uh, 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 run with across the line and close transactions that ultimately attract investment. Uh, in addition to developing those blueprints, we're looking to connect project pipeline providers with deal structuring support, which comes from financial institutions, um, bringing some of these delivery parties with investors, and generally sharing information with the field to accelerate the adoption of the blueprints. Well, I, we have no doubt that conservation finance and that private investment in conservation finance would grow organically and would happen over time. But one thing we don't have in the conservation space is time. So by bringing these sectors together, asking everyone to take to lower their guard, including the private sector financial institutions involved, and work on something that ultimately will provide benefits for everybody, we believe we are able to short circuit some of that growth that would happen organically and accelerate the process. Um, I'm getting towards the end here, but I'll just mention uh, that um, endorsing institutions contribute financially or intellectually to the uh, specific CPIC activities. Uh, I won't go into much more detail about uh, what it is that we intend to uh, deliver, but ultimately that the goal is to develop those transactions idea that will attract private investment. Some of the current, uh, the founding members of uh, CPIC uh, in Hawaii uh, 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 last fall uh, include the organizations that you see here. Much of the organizations represented on this call are uh, endorsing institutions of the statement of intent of CPIC. Uh, these are some of their logos. Uh, and in terms of the organization of uh, of uh, CPIC and how it is currently functioning, there is a steering committee consisting of the four founding institutions, uh, Cornell, Credit Suisse, uh, IUCN, and the Nature Conservancy. In, and in addition, there are five working groups that are focused on these five selected areas, coastal resilience, forest restoration, green infrastructure for watershed management, sustainable agriculture, and sustainable coastal fisheries. And I should mention that each of the co-leads of these five working groups are also part of the steering committee. Something that we have been debating recently, and that's the reason there is a question mark at the end of it, is whether um, a structuring brain trust, uh, something of a sixth working group, uh, would make sense in order to bring together um, not just conservationists and finance people working together, but in, to, to house really senior structuring expertise that can serve as a sounding board uh, and for the work that some of the that all of the other working groups uh, are doing. Uh, and hopefully, through in, in doing that, come up with with uh, some products that that uh, may uh, get us a lot further than we are right now in terms of how much finance or how much funding, to be precise, uh, uh, there is uh, coming from the private sector and and is going into conservation activity. Uh, and I see him at the 40 minute mark, uh, Sarah, so maybe I should leave it there. Okay. All right, John, thank you. This was fantastic. Um, if you have any uh, final slides with your 
contact information. You might want to pop that up so people could get that while we handle some of the questions. My apologies. I did not include that uh, oh, okay. in this slide. Oh, no worries. Um, and we can we can post your your. Uh, so what's the best? What is the best way to get in touch with you if people have um, questions? Uh, feel free to to make uh, my my email okay. address available. Okay. All right. I'll I'll post that at some point. Uh, okay. Um, great. And I just wanted to remind everyone um, to, for asking questions, you type them into the question panel of the user interface, and then we can relay them to John. So we already have a number of great questions. So let's see. Um, here's one. Uh, John mentioned investors wanting a timeline for return on investment. However, many conservation commodities take time to generate, such as fisheries for fisheries to rebound or carbon to be stored, etc. How can CPIC support efforts that require upfront costs but may not have a return for several years? Uh, with great difficulty. Um, that is very much a concern on the part of investors and in that many a deal, not just in the conservation finance space, but in every uh, 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 field of economic activity have failed to get off the ground because returns do not come um, at a time or quickly enough for most investors. The riskier the investment, the shorter the time horizon for an investor to be comfortable. Uh, and that is something that, uh, that we need to deal with. That's, not, that's a problem for, for everyone in finance. Different people uh, uh, address it in different ways, but I can point out one or two obvious ways of addressing that. Um, one is through guarantees. I've talked about private investors, whether be they institutional or individual. And I've talked about uh, the organizations that are actually uh, doing the deals. Uh, in most cases, banks, but not necessarily. Uh, uh, you know, asset managers working with external partners, structuring some form of investable product. However, there's a number of, uh, whether it's uh, multilateral development banks or other similar institutions, uh, that are able to take the long view and um, are able, very specifically, to provide guarantees to investors uh, who are sort of uncomfortable with, uh, with the fact that, for example, they, they would not be seeing returns for five years or 10 years if they put their money into this particular investment. Uh, so, um, you know, guarantees from, you know, whether it's, uh, uh, with the multilateral investment uh, 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 guarantee agency or, or uh, um, any of a number of other organizations uh, that exist uh, to facilitate economic activity, many of which have conservation-related investments on their radar screen, uh, can make possible uh, a transaction that, because of the time frame, would not otherwise be possible. Okay, thank you so much, John. Um, and I'd let everybody know that uh, we put up uh, John's email and um, a link to the CPIC web page up in the in the chat area of the user interface. So uh, you can you can find that information there. Um, a couple questions about CPIC itself. Um, I'll, I'll sort of lump them together, and I can remind you what they are. Uh, does it, CPIC have a strategic plan? People can go read. Is it worldwide in scope, and how do people get involved? Um, it is worldwide in scope. Uh, the, um, there is a website that has only been up now for about a month, uh, CPIC Finance, all one word, cpicfinance.com. And uh, we purposely selected a .com rather than uh, a, a .org uh, 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 host because we felt that uh, it was it was important to get across the, um, the message that this is about developing transactions that ultimately have um, commercial merit and that could be attractive to private investors. Uh, there's a, a quite a bit of information there. 
do we have a formal strategic plan uh, that uh, lays out sort of specific next steps for the next several years? Not at this point uh, that is posted. That is something that we're in the process of developing. Uh, there is some information uh, on the website about the work of the working groups, et cetera. Uh, happy to discuss uh, more detail further, but we don't have a sort of the 20-page report that we can easily circulate that tells you everything you need to know about where CPIC will be, uh, you know, five or ten years from now. Okay, That's great. To come. To come. And the third part was, uh, are can are you who participates in the working groups, and are, are there avenues for people to get involved? Uh, yes. Um, on the website, there is a an application form. Uh, which people sort of fill out and uh, explain what it is that, that they feel they are going to be able to get out of CPIC and what they can contribute to CPIC. And um, that goes to the steering committee and we discuss uh, each case individually. Um, there are certain categories of members that uh, we feel we're getting, at least getting close to having enough of, and that is probably the more traditional environmental uh, organizations. Um, there are other categories of members that we feel we need a lot more of, uh, including uh, finance actors. Uh, we don't actually have a large insurance company. That would be um, a terrific addition to the, uh, to the uh, uh, membership. Um, so, but, but we, we do not say no to organizations that you know have a bona fide interest and uh, 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 are committed to the mission of the initiative as well as uh, uh, as well as uh, being able to contribute to the work of the organization okay. and by the way I mentioned the word organization a little loosely we are not a 501c3 uh, or equivalent not US self-standing legal entity at this point. It is merely a coming together of uh, like-minded organizations from finance uh, and uh, the environmental sector and others. Okay, great. Thank you, John. Um, and also to let everyone know, if you also look in the chat slash question uh, area, Nick, uh, and thank you, Nick, has uh, also posted the um, link to where the recording of the webinar will be, if you wanted to view it again or pass it on, because several of you have asked for that. Okay, a question. I represent a company that produces a product with substantial ecological benefits as it supports a sustainable aquaculture practice. Uh, we are ready and looking for equity investments. How do we attract investment from those who are ready to, to deploy investments? Um. That is um, something that CPIC would like to do as a, or help facilitate as a next step. I mean, there's plenty of that happening right now. Right? There's, there, it's, it, it's not specific to this sector or to this time. It's since time immemorial, there have been people with good ideas or good products looking for other people who have uh, the ability to finance the scaling up and production of those products or the development of those ideas. Uh, yes, uh, CPIC would like to be able to do that uh, in this space to facilitate some of that work. We're not in. We're not there yet. We're, we've only been sort of in existence for uh, 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 just over three quarters. Uh, we um, we have been sort of organizing ourselves, forming the working groups, uh, uh, developing the governance mechanisms, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and the main and immediate uh, 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 goal for, for the coalition is to develop some of those blueprints and make them available. Uh, some of this other work is, is at least from CPIC's point of view, a next step. Nevertheless, um, you know, lots of people are doing this now. It's just a matter of, of um, Sort of getting out there and and developing a list of organizations that could be invest uh, interested in investing in the idea and um, and knocking on doors. It's not easy work, but uh, but uh, but it has to be done. 
Okay, thank you. And I think you might have, so maybe a little early in CPIC's work, um, but there was this, this question, can you describe progress in attracting investor interest to date? And what are the key questions that you're getting that, if answered, are likely to see investor participation growing quickly? I alluded to, to this earlier, but the conservation finance space is is in the enviable position of being one of these rare fields where people are dying to put their money into, and there just isn't enough product that uh, that is you know a reasonably good investment from a risk return profile. Um, it, 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 but there's just the, the opportunities for for uh, deploying capital are just not there yet with few expenses. Uh, some of you may know of the fact that three new sustainable investment funds have been announced over the course of the last six months or so. Uh, sustainable fisheries funds, I should say, have been announced over the course of the last six months or so. And uh, others are mm, almost surely to come. Um, so there is investor interest. What there isn't enough of, and this is part of the motivation for CPIC, what there isn't enough of is uh, 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 you know, those products that, that investors can look at and say, yeah, this looks like you know, a reasonable risk, uh, a risk that I can manage, a risk that I'm comfortable with, and, uh, and that delivers returns that, uh, that I, can, you know, I can justify. Okay, Does wonderful. Uh, I think so, and it answers uh, some other questions as well. Um, are you able to list the three uh, the three fisheries funds you just mentioned? Uh, sure. Um, one is associated with uh, rare. Um, there's another one that is uh, associated with uh, Althelia. Yeah. Yep. And there's a third that is associated with encouraged capital. I okay. should mention that non-US based funds for various regulatory reasons find it uh, uh, usually not worth their while to, to sell product uh, or to raise funds in the United States because of the additional regulatory hurdles that they need to meet uh, and because there is so much willing investment in Europe for this, uh, for this space. As many of you will know, when it comes to sustainable finance and, uh, uh, generally speaking, corporate sustainability, uh, Europe is is often one or two steps ahead of North America. Um, but uh, but but of course, Encourage Capital is is based in the U.S. Now, um, you're likely not to find a lot of publicly available information about this, other than references here and there and uh, uh, online, because since their uh, uh, investment products that target accredited investors, they don't advertise. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they're cautious about you know, it, it, you know, making a lot of information about the funds available. Publicly. Interesting. Okay. The, lest they be overwhelmed with. Uh, let, lest they be uh, pot uh, let, lest they potentially get in trouble with. Uh, Okay. with the regulators really okay okay because it could be viewed as a sale to the public and if there's a sale to the public to non quote accredited investors then that requires you know additional hurdles okay um i think we'll tackle uh one or two more questions the next one um the tourism industry hopefully has a vested interest in coral reef health have they engaged in these efforts? Also, has the insurance industry also the insurance industry has a vested interest, uh, such as protection from storm surges? Have, have they engaged in these efforts either? Uh, really interesting question, given the timing. Uh, Swiss Re just announced uh, in the last uh, few days a um, an insurance product that is going to insure. Uh, a chunk of, of the Mesoamerican reef uh, uh, because of the damage that would accrue if uh, some kind of storm uh, were to damage coastal property. Uh, so this is basically a, 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 a insurance for natural capital. 
uh, from that point of view, it's, it's, it's a new and interesting thing that is happening now. Uh, generally speaking, I don't think there's been a lot of, um, of success of, say, hotel owners along a vulnerable beach coming together and saying, okay, let's do something about this. Let's, let's uh, you know, come together and take care of this reef that is protecting us all because uh, uh, you know, if, if it fails or if it is destroyed and a storm surge hits us, it's going to hit us all. Um, generally speaking, there's a lot of, uh, you know, it's, it's prisoner's dilemma kind of situation with, with uh, 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 people or particular uh, 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 lake waterfront facilities uh, not participating in the effort. It, it works best if it is mandated uh, by some kind of authority. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. All right. And um, last question. Uh, can you give examples of potential investment products that might be suitable for small island developing states? Um, cat bonds are one example. Uh, so-called cat bonds, uh, catastrophe bonds are the bigger product. Uh, that's a, it, it's a kind of bond that in, an investor purchases uh, and uh, where the investor assumes the risk of some damage to uh, the, the underlying asset that is being insured. Uh, that's just one example. Um, there are surely others. A fisheries products, I think, are something that you'll see more and more that will be of interest to and ultimately benefit uh, small island states. Um, and I'm sure we could we could uh, 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 come up with other examples. Okay. Okay, John, this is fabulous. This is, uh, I, I venture to say, a really new area for a lot of people. It certainly is for me. And so there's a lot to learn in this area. And we so appreciate you taking the time to talk about it. And we so appreciate you doing the work with CPIC um, to help make it a reality. Uh, My pleasure. Okay. And thank you everyone who was able to attend. We really appreciate your attendance and uh, you have the, uh, hopefully you're able to grab any links you needed in terms of how to contact John, how to look at more at uh, CPIC's website and also the recording for this webinar. So uh, we hope to see you on future webinars and, and thank you again to John. Hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their day. Thank you. Okay. All right. Bye everyone.